Thou art the man by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter twenty three. Fancies that might be facts that are. Lady Penrith was again missing at afternoon tea, and again John Coverdale looked round the drawing room with a countenance expressive of blank disappointment. He had not been with the shooters who had just returned, and who were having a substantial egg and toast tea in the breakfast room. He came to the drawing room from a long afternoon's reading in the almost unused library, a spacious apartment which had once been an armory and in which three great carved oak bookcases filled with eighteenth-century literature, books which no one ever looked at, represented culture at Killander Castle. He came for rest and relaxation in society, which was always delightful to him, and missing that one gracious figure in his survey of the drawing-room, his disappointment was no less obvious than it had been yesterday. Coralie looked at him sharply with her bright grey eyes. She was beginning to entertain very unpleasant suspicions about Mr. Coverdale, no she hasn't come home from her solitary drive she said answering his look my aunt is getting quite dissipated ain't she those ponies are spoiling her orderly habits she ought not to be out after five o'clock on such an afternoon as this remarked lady selina i don't understand this passion for long drives i have no doubt lady penrith has gone on some kindly errand protested mr coverdale seating himself near the great tudor window from which he could watch the drive the landscape was darkening without and the room was darkening within in a few minutes the servants would be coming with lamps and curtains would be drawn to shut out land and sky coralie poured out the tea and waited upon Lady Selina and Mr. Coverdale. The lady gave her plenty of work, took two cups and a half of tea, and played havoc with a dish of hot currant cake. But the gentleman let his tea grow cold while he sat, silently musing by the window. "'Ain't you cold over there, Mr. Coverdale, so far from the fire?' asked cora thank you no he answered with a start and you haven't touched your tea let me give you a fresh cup you are very kind it really doesn't matter the lamps were brought in the curtains shut out sky and more it was night now or seemed night mr coverdale rose with a sigh i'll take a turn on the terrace he said you keep this room rather too warm for me ladies with your splendid wood fires yes it's rather too like the tropical house at kew agreed coralie i'll go with you he smiled resignedly and made way for her to pass out of the door before him However much a man may wish to be alone with his own thoughts, he can't say so when a lady, charming or otherwise, volunteers her society. They went to the gravel walk in front of the castle, a walk which commanded the carriage sweep. They walked up and down briskly under the grey autumn sky, but Mr. Coverdale was no more conversational here than he had been in the drawing-room. In vain did Coralie start subjects which usually interested him. He answered absently, or he did not answer at all. "'What a dreamer you are!' she exclaimed at last. 
A man must dream, however futile some of his dreams may be, he answered quietly. Ah, there is her ladyship's carriage. What a quick ear you have. Don't you hear it? Yes, I can hear it now, but I didn't when you spoke. I had not been listening so intently as you, added Cora significantly. He did not notice the insinuation, but walked quickly towards the carriage sweep, and was standing at the foot of the stone steps, ready to help Lady Penrith out of her carriage when it stopped. "'I am very late,' she said apologetically, "'but I have been a long way. "'And you must be expiring for want of your tea,' exclaimed Cora. Do come into the warm drawing-room and let me minister to you. No, thank you, Cora. I have had tea, and am very warm in this fur coat. Mr. Coverdale, would you mind taking a tr turn on the terrace with me before we go indoors? I want a little serious talk with you. Coralie stared aghast. With her growing suspicions about John Coverdale, this seemed extraordinary conduct on her aunt's part. And I should be in the way if I stayed, she said pertly. For this one occasion, yes, Cora. Then I retire as gracefully as I can. "'But I hope you'll change your mind, aunt, "'and let me order some fresh tea to be ready when you come indoors. "'Please, no, don't trouble about me. "'I shall go straight to my room.' "'Lady Penrith and Mr. Coverdale walked nearly to the end of the terrace "'before the silence was broken, "'and then Sybil opened her heart to this Anglican priest fearlessly, and told him the story of those eventful months before Lord Penrith appeared upon the scene as her suitor. "'I know you are the soul of honor," she said, "'and you are a priest. I can confide in you. I can ask you to help me, as I dare not ask my husband, although all that I am telling you tonight is known to him, all except the events of last month, of which he knows nothing. You will help me, won't you, Mr. Coverdale? With all my heart and mind, he answered, with an earnestness which she could not mistake. She told him every detail of that night in the village jail, how she had allowed Urquhart to act upon her fears, and how she had urged Brandon Mountford to escape. Was I wrong? she asked. Was I his enemy rather than his friend? In my view of the case, he should have stayed to face his accusers. He should not have allowed himself to be persuaded. Oh, it was my fault. I was made to believe that I was saving him from death, or, at least, from lifelong misery and shame, and I sent him to his death, or, or to wretchedness worse than death. And then she told him of that pencil scrawl, and her interpretation of it, and of the scene with the vicar's wife and daughter that afternoon. That this unknown inmate of the vicarage was Brandon Mountford seemed to Mr. Coverdale the wildest and most romantic of fancies. On the other hand, that penciled appeal in a handwriting which Lady Penrith recognized as Mountford's had to be accounted for, and then place and time agreed, the stormy sea the coming of the unknown lodger in the early morning, the hidden life, with its studied seclusion, these facts pointed to some guilty secret, and any man 
to whom these facts became known was bound in honour to investigate them had john coverdale lighted upon such a mystery in his own parish he would not have rested till he had unearthed the evil-doers his mission was to carry light into dark places you may be mistaken as to the identity of this person he said after a thoughtful pause but there can be no doubt it is a case for investigation i have heard something of mr carpew's character and antecedents which make me inclined to think he might lend himself to a villainous scheme if it were made worth his while i am going to st jude's to-morrow directly after breakfast will you go with me mr coverdale certainly it is the very thing i was going to propose let me be with you and it shall go hard if we don't succeed in seeing this poor gentleman yes yes with your help i must succeed how good you are good when it is such happiness to serve you she did not notice the earnestness of his tone in that one instant of self-betrayal did not notice how the cold grave manner changed suddenly to warmest feeling only to lapse again into that thoughtful calm which was his distinguishing characteristic with theo at my side i shall be strong she said i felt so weak and helpless to-day so easily baffled by that shifty woman i did not know what i ought to do whether i ought to insist upon waiting for her husband's return it seemed so feeble in me to leave that house convinced as i was that brandon was there so near me and in such bitter need of me but you can help him you can release him from bondage they won't be able to trick you there is one thing to be remembered lady penrith a terrible accusation hangs over this man's head if he is the man you think and for him to reappear in the neighborhood will be to reopen that old story let it be reopened i would risk that let him face the accusation as he would have done in the beginning but for me i know that he was innocent that it was another hand that killed my adopted sister whom do you suspect i cannot tell you yet i may trust you even with that suspicion by and by no i would not fear for brandon to face his accusers new evidence would come to light perhaps if the history of that night were gone into coldly quietly the facts sifted and weighed as they could not be a few hours after the tragedy when every one was bewildered with the horror of that poor girl's death i know that he was innocent and if he is living hidden in st jude's vicarage you would risk the consequences of removing him the almost inevitable reopening of the inquiry yes i would risk that so be it lady penrith then you and i will tackle the vicar to-morrow morning or if he be out of the way when we call we will make things so unpleasant for him that he won't be able to evade us very long you think he may not see us to-morrow i think if he is the scoundrel you believe him to be he may find some excuse for not receiving us sibyl breathed a despairing sigh oh how difficult it is to right a wrong she exclaimed lady penrith and mr coverdale drove away from the castle before ten o'clock next morning in the ladies barouche with a pair of horses that made light work of the distance 
and hilly roads the shooters had set out before the barouche drove up to the front of the castle and there were only lady selina and miss urquhart at home to wonder at this strange proceeding coralie ran out to the steps to watch the departure oh what a delicious morning she cried how fresh and crisp the air feels and then as with a sudden impulse do let me go with you aunt not to-day cora i am taking mr coverdale to see some poor people you would only be bored no no i wouldn't i am positively longing for a drive then gratify your longing you have not driven your own particular pony for ever so long i hate driving myself i like to enjoy the air and the landscape then get a groom to drive you said sibyl curtly and the barouche drove off leaving cora standing at the top of the steps discomfited now what in the name of all that's ridiculous does this mean she asked herself can it be that the sage the calm the ineffable lady penrith is carrying on a flirtation with this pious parson under all our noses i know that he is in love with her the creature has not even the art to conceal his emotions she ran upstairs to her own cosy den and wrote her account of lady penrith's strange conduct of this morning for transmission to german street all compunction that she had felt in the beginning when the office of spy was first proposed to her had died out of her crooked little mind and now that lady penrith's influence was spoiling her chances of a great match gratitude to the benefactress who had redeemed her from bondage was a thing of the past what frauds these icily beautiful women are she said to herself as she folded the closely written sheet which occupied her for nearly an hour and then opening her secret volume she relieved her mind by scribbling ideas and feelings which she would have imparted to no living confidant life at the castle was growing lonelier and duller the smart soldier who frankly admired her sharp sayings and gave her a nightly lesson in billiards was to leave that afternoon and a keswick squire had left the day before the house party after to-day's luncheon would be reduced to lady selina and mr coverdale whose holiday from parish cares was being stretched longer than he had intended his parish was at the east end of london where he lived a life which would have been self-sacrifice for the son of the poorest commoner and where he was generally known to all the overworked mothers and all the dirty little children as father coverdale end of chapter twenty three